How many of you have ever been in a situation where you were in a place and immediately you got the vibe, you got the feeling, I don't belong here. What am I doing here? I don't belong here. Anybody? Maybe you walked in uh, the wrong restroom and it's like, oh, this is the ladies' room or the men's room. Or like, oh, I'm, I don't belong here. I was, uh, during my studies, um, I did an internship in America and I was visiting different churches and I was in Kansas. Anybody's ever been to Kansas before? Really? Sorry, guys. Why? Well, why would you go to Kansas? <laughs> but you live not too far from Kansas, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, Kansas, and, um, and I was in a town, well, we were in Kansas City, which is an actual city, that's not too bad, but then we were invited to this church in Mead, Kansas, Google it, M-E-A-D-E, in the middle of nowhere. We had to drive for seven hours from Kansas City just through cornfields straight for hours. Like, who lives here? And then we arrived at this town, and uh, it was really like time stood still, and we asked this lady, is there anybody, any place where we can go have lunch? And she said, well, there's only one restaurant. You can go have a hamburger at Bob's. So obviously we didn't know who Bob is, but okay, well, let's find Bob. And so we went to this place, and we opened the door to that restaurant, and it was like a movie. It was like music stopped. Everybody turned around, and they were asking, are you lost? What are you doing here? <laughs> I guess I was the, uh, the, the first and only German who's ever been in this small town of less than a thousand people. But it was so, like, I still remember, it's like, this was like, it's a completely different world. And they looked at me like, are you lost? Are you confused? What are you doing here? Um, maybe you've had that feeling before. Maybe uh, you've had that feeling when you go to a very high-end shop and you can tell the, the people who sell stuff, they're like, they look at you and they look up, you know, like, what are you doing here? You're not going to buy anything here, you know? <laughs> Maybe you have that feeling when you go to the gym. What are you doing here? <laughs> oh, you know? Maybe you have that feeling when you are in certain parts of Berlin. There are some neighborhoods that are a bit sketchy, and you realize, I don't really belong here. I don't really know what's kind of the social behavior, and like, uh, you have that feeling. Some, some of us, you've had that feeling in a church, where people look, you come in and they look at you and what are you doing here? In fact, why don't we, because this is the theme of this, this question, that we, we're in a series of questions that God asks us and this is the question we're going to look at today. It's like, what are you doing here? Why don't you turn to your neighbor <laughs> and just very rudely just say to that person, what are you doing here? Come on, let's just do it for fun. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> are you lost? <laughs> All right, turn, turn to your other neighbor your second choice neighbor, <laughs> and repeat the question, what are you doing here? <laughs> All right, guys, as I said, we are in part three of our series uh, on questions that God is asking us, and today I want to look at um, a character in the Bible in the Old Testament who is a prophet, maybe one of the boldest, most courageous characters in the Bible, a man named Elijah, the prophet Elijah. Anybody heard of Elijah before? Yes, most of you have, many of you have. Elijah has been a prophet in the Bible. He was a bold man of God. Uh, even his name was bold. Uh, his name, Elijah, in, in Hebrew, it's Eliyahu. Can you say that? Eliyahu? Eliyahu? There's supposed to be a bit of phlegm. Eliyahu, yeah? Okay. Like the person sitting in front of you should feel that you're saying Eliyahu. Okay, go again. Spit it out. Eliyahu. There you go. <laughs> Anybody felt anything? No. <laughs> Eliyahu. The Eliyahu translated means, my God is Yahweh. Okay? And the reason why that is such a bold name is because we need to understand the times in which Elijah, Eliyahu, lived. Elijah lived at a time where the people, his entire nation, the entire society have uh, forsaken the God of the Bible. They were saying, this God is outdated. This God is irrelevant. We have progressed. We've advanced from this worldview. <laughs> sort of like Berlin as well. Like, oh, this is from the past. But the people then, they have turned to another God, uh, the God called Baal or Baal. How do you say it? Baal? Baal? Okay, apparently that's how you say it. It's uh, the Canaanite uh, God of fertility. And the worship for that God was quite uh, extreme. They had child sacrifices to worship that God. There was temple prostitution. There was cutting of yourself to worship that God. It, was, it wasn't an easy kind of soft kind of God. It was quite a heavy, intense kind of worship. And so here comes Elijah, Eliyahu, and he, his, his name even says, my, not, my God is Yahweh, not Baal. 
my God, it's quite bold in that society where everybody was done with the God of the Bible. He says, my God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's my God. And so he's sort of the, obviously, he's the protagonist of the story. Uh, Elijah, Elijah was this prophet that God raised to call the nation back to him. And the antagonists of the story are two people, one guy, the king named Ahab. He was a wicked king. And also his wife called Jezebel. She was the wicked king's wife, the queen Jezebel, and she was probably even more powerful than Ahab, okay? So they were bad, and they were all for, hey, we should all worship Baal, and uh, we meet them, um, Ahab and Jezebel, in 1 Kings chapter 19, if you have your message notes on, in your card, or you can read along here on the screen. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, when King Ahab got home, so he was away, he got home and he told his wife Jezebel everything that Elijah had done. What did he do? He killed all the prophets of Baal. Wow, okay, it's quite an intense start to uh, this chapter. You would think like, okay, what happened? Okay, we need to, uh, we can't look into it in detail, but just briefly, the previous chapter is quite, is one of the, the crazy chapters in the Bible. There was a religious showdown on a mountain called Carmel. Okay, Mount Carmel, there was a religious showdown where Elijah being the only prophet of God, of the Bible, of Yahweh, he challenged 450 prophets and priests of Baal for a religious competition, for like a, a, a match or a, like a competition or a war of the gods, if you will, okay? A war of the gods. What did I say? Not war of the gods. A, doesn't matter. A battle of the gods. That sounds better, okay? So the idea was every one of them would uh, prepare a sacrifice, the priests of Baal would prepare a sacrifice, and Elijah would prepare a sacrifice, a cow. And, uh, and then they said, we're going to pray to our God now. You pray to Baal, I'm going to pray to the God of Israel, or to God of Abraham. And, and then we're going to see which God responds to our prayer, and, and which God will send fire down from heaven to consume the offering, that, the sacrifice that we bring. And Elijah, he was quite confident that this plan would work out, and he said, why don't you guys... Go ahead and start. And so these priests and prophets, they started, it says they started to pray and dance around their sacrifice uh, for hours, and nothing happened. <laughs> and, and, and Elijah, you know, he, being so confident that his plan was going to work, he even says, maybe Baal is sleeping. You should scream louder. And so they did. They prayed louder. And they went, Baal, listen to us. Send fire from heaven. And they prayed and prayed. And they even started, it says they started to cut themselves around. It was crazy what was happening. But nothing happened. No fire from heaven. And then at some point in the evening, they turned to Elijah. And they said, well, let's see what your God is going to do. And Elijah just knelt down. Actually, no, before he did that, he had um, buckets of water poured on the sacrifice. Just to make sure, nobody says later on, oh, this was dry ground and it was just a spark or something, you know, threw your cigarette down. But no, no, just, this was, was actually, this was actually, no, this water, it's going to be evident this is water from God. And so I had water poured on the sacrifice and then he knelt down and he just prayed, oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Make yourself known today. Let it be known to all these people that you are the true God of Israel. Amen. Fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. And all of the people who were watching this, they fell on their knees and they worshiped God and they were in awe. And it was like, oh, we've been fooled. God of Abraham, he's the true God of Israel. Yahweh is God, Eliyahu. And then Elijah even says, hey, all these false prophets over here, seize them because they fooled you. And so they captured all these 450 prophets and Elijah killed them one after the other. Quite a slaughter. That's how chapter 18 ends. And in chapter 19, Ahab, who has watched this, he comes back home and he tells Jezebel, you won't believe what happened. <laughs> Baal didn't send any fire. It was so embarrassing. And you won't believe what happened Elijah, he killed all of our prophets and priests. And when Jezebel heard this, she became furious. Let's continue reading. You still with me? In chapter 2. Uh, so Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this, to this time tomorrow I have not killed you, Elijah, just as you killed them, these prophets. So in the next 24 hours, Elijah, your time is up. And then it says, Elijah was afraid and fled 
for his life. And I don't know about you, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, Elijah, what happened to you, man? In the previous chapter, in chapter 18, you stood up, faced, you faced 450 priests of this idol, Baal, and you weren't afraid of them. And now you're chickening out and you're running for your life because of one woman? Come on, like what's happening? Am I the only one who has that question? Like why is he afraid right now? And it's, it's a bit... Uh, it's a bit weird, but I must admit, I'm so glad this verse is in the Bible. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. Because if we were only to see the hero side of Elijah, I wouldn't be inspired by him. I would be crushed by this example. Because I realize yeah, I'm never going to be like him, this heroic Old Testament figure. But because we see him also afraid, running for his life, I'm thinking, okay, now I can relate to this guy. Because uh, maybe you want to write this down. Even godly people struggle. Even godly. It seems so like, of course they do. But some of us, we need to actually write it down to get it into our heads. Even godly people struggle. You can be a man of faith, but that doesn't mean you are immune to stress or to fear. And that doesn't mean you aren't vulnerable. Okay? Uh, a lot of Christians think somehow that, oh, once I reach a certain level in my walk with God, like once I've followed him for X number of years, or once I uh, gave away X amount of euros into charity, or once I've memorized X amount of uh, uh, Bible verses, once I've reached a certain level, then I won't have to struggle anymore. But the Bible is full of stories who, who loved God and who followed him for their whole lives, but they're still uh, struggling. The people God uses in great ways are not people who are uh, fearless, but they are faithful, okay? You can be faithful and still have loads of fear in your life. Does Elijah have great faith? Yes, he does. Of course he does. Does Elijah have great fears? Yes, he does. And I'm reading this and it's like, oh, good. I'm glad he does because that means I'm not the only one who feels that way. Listen, you can be strong in your faith but still struggle with anxieties, still struggle with depression, still struggle with loneliness, still struggle with all kinds of stress or burnout. It doesn't mean that your faith is weak. These, these two aren't mutually exclusive. It's one of those paradoxes again. Does that make sense? So as we continue reading there, there's, um, we read that um, he runs to a town called Beersheba, which is in the south of Judah, and that's where Elijah, he leaves his servant there. In other words, he fires his staff, which means he quits the ministry. He resigns. He says, I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, I'm so not going to continue this, because what's the point? In verse 4, he says, I've had enough, Lord. You have this on the screen. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Again, it's a bit weird. Maybe you're thinking that as well. It's like, hey, he's running for his life. Why is he now asking God to kill him? And see, I think um, Elijah wasn't afraid of losing his life. I think he was afraid that the life he was living wasn't making any difference, wasn't having any impact. Because you see, he was just, he just won the greatest triumphs, one of the greatest triumphs in the entire Bible on that Mount Carmel. And he, like, single handedly, um, yeah, identified Baal as an idol, as a false god. And he killed, he, he cleansed the nation of this idolatry. And he thought to himself, surely this is going to be the downfall of Ahab and Jezebel. This is going to spark a revolution, a political revolution, and maybe also a spiritual revival. This is now going to be the big game changer. This is it. But then when he heard that Jezebel was still in power, there was no coup, there was no revolution, there was no change, they weren't overthrown. He realizes, man, even this spectacular sh showdown hasn't changed anything. If that doesn't change anything, what will? And he just kind of, he went downhill from there. In his mind, he said, like, okay, it's not going to make a difference. I can try. I can give 110%. I can, you know, show all these signs of who God is and how great it is. It's still not changing anything. This is pointless. This is hopeless. This is, this is like, you know, I've, I've won a battle, but we're still losing the war. 
I've, I've pulled out a few weeds, but it's still going to grow back tomorrow. What's the point? What a waste. What's the point of it? Jezebel is still on the throne, and he's saying, I'm just like my ancestors who've tried before me. They've also failed. What's different with me? I can live this life. I can pour out everything I have. It's not going to change. Do you, do you know these thoughts? Some of you are very familiar with these thoughts. Some of you are in that place right now. It's a dark place to be where you maybe think, like, I can do, I can try as hard as I want. My boss is not going to change, is he? Or my teacher is not going to change. Or my dad or my mom is not going to change, no matter what I do. What's the point in fighting for my marriage? It's not going to get better, is it? What's the point in praying for healing? I'm never going to be well. What's the point in going to rehab? I'm just going to fall back into it anyways. What's the point in praying for my prodigal son or my prodigal daughter or brother or sister? They're never going to come home. What's the point in inviting my friend to church? She's never going to come. You know, it's a dark place to be when you have lost all sense of any hope there. That's where Elijah was. And now let's read how God meets him there in verse 5. It says, he lay down and slept under a broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, fear thou not. No, that's not what it says. I bring you great tidings and great news. No, it's not what it says. Repent, you are on the wrong track. It's not what it says either. It's also the angel didn't come and say, Elijah, you are fired. With this attitude, you are useless to God. We're going to find another prophet. It's not what the angel said. What does he say? Get up and eat. Amen. Guys, this is my life verse. <laughs> If, you know, I can live by that. Amen. Anybody else? So you, you, maybe, you know, some of us, we have a, a life verse that it's just kind of, that's a theme of our life. Maybe you have a very spiritual one, like, oh yeah, mine is Galatians 2. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Good for you. My verse is, get up and eat. <laughs> you can pray about it. Pray for me. Um, <laughs> okay, so he looked around, Elijah, he looked around, and then there Beside his head, I mean, how much easier could God have made this? Beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. Now, I don't know about you, I find it remarkable that even when Elijah ran away from God, God still chased after him to provide for him. What a God. Guys, this is my story. That even when I mess it up and turn away from God, he comes and pursues me. He chases after me. In his goodness, in his kindness, it reaches to the heavens, as we said. Yeah, he, that's your story as well. That's the story of this Bible. That's the story of the gospel, that we have a God who chases after us even when we have turned away from him. We can see that here. God comes and provides for him. But I want you to see this, that God persistently and continuously and exclusively gives his grace to people who have not asked for it, who don't deserve it, And we don't even appreciate it when they get it. That's our God. And it says, he ate and drank and then lay down again. And then the angel of the Lord came a second time. There's even dessert, guys. It's biblical to have dessert and cake or whatever was the second round. Okay, I feel strongly about this point. I see some of you writing it down. Not as many as I was hoping, but it's okay. This is not just, okay, seriously. This is not just a picture of um, I believe just physical provision and physical food. There's a, a spiritual parallel here, a spiritual application to this, because the Bible says that man does not live by bread alone, but also by the very words that come from the mouth of God. The words of God are bread to us, spiritually speaking. They feed us, they nourish us, they strengthen us. And um, have you noticed this? The, the angel, he comes and he places the food right next to his head. Every morning... God wakes me up, and right next to my head, fully charged, is my phone. And on that phone, I have that Bible app. Yeah, how many of you have the Bible app? If not, you need to download the Bible app, where you can, for free, have access to all kinds of translations in almost any language in the world. That I just, it's just there. It's provided. I have access to it. And God says, get up and eat. And what do I do? Instagram. WhatsApp. 
Facebook, YouTube, right? I just don't like, I don't, I don't get up and eat, feed myself at his word. Have you noticed this? The angel, he, he uh, baked, he prepared, the, he cooked the food, and then he served it right next to sleeping Elijah, who was sleeping under that tree. And then he woke him, and then he spoke to him, but he didn't spoon feed him. Have you noticed this? He said, get up and eat. You got to go get up and eat. Guys, God has placed you in this church where we make a big deal out of this book. God has given you this word, this Bible, even on your phone. You have access to it, okay? God's given you his promises. God's given you a small group. God's given you so much. It's all right there beside your head. But you've got to get up and eat. You've got to get up and eat and, and feed yourself from this word and apply it and live it so it strengthens you, so it nourishes you. Uh, let me just ask this. How, how many of you are married in the room? Uh, just, yeah. How many of you, maybe your marriage is similar to ours where I constantly, whenever I leave the house, I'm looking for like mostly my wallet or my keys. Anybody? And I, I'm looking everywhere, literally everywhere. And then Jenny, <laughs> somehow... She says, it's right in front of you. Like, it's, it's sitting right there. And it's like, how did she do that? I was looking there just now, and it wasn't there. I swear to God, it wasn't there. But then when she looks for it, she finds it. And we kind of have this rule that whatever Jenny can't find is lost. It's, just, it's gone. But, <laughs> okay. but Jenny finds the things that I'm looking for, and I just can't see it, even though it's right in front of me. And sometimes she takes my wallet, and she just hits me on the head. It's like, it's right in front of you. If you have a Bible, would you take... Turn to your neighbor and just hit your neighbor on the head with your Bible, okay? Or with your, just like, hey, it's right in front of you, okay? It's right here. Sometimes, guys, we, <laughs> sometimes we misspend our time and we're, we're asking God to give us something that's, it's right in front of us. It's right here. We're saying to God, God, give me more faith. And God says, I've given you faith. Why don't you feed the faith I've already given you? You have faith, but your faith is malnourished. You got to feed that faith that I've given you. God, give me joy. And God says, I've given you my promises to rejoice in. God, give me, give me peace. Well, here's my word. This is like a, a refuge, a hiding place for you. Hide yourself in my word. God, I need direction from you. And God says, my word is a light unto your path, a lamp for your feet. It shows you where to go. God's word, it strengthens us for what's ahead of us, but we got to get up and eat. Let's keep reading. Um, in verse 8, then the food gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and for 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, which is much further south even. He's still going in the wrong direction, it seems. And there he came to a cave where he spent the night. Now, we don't have time to look into this much, but those of you who maybe read the Bible and you're really good with knowing the parallels and kind of the, oh, maybe you've realized Elijah was not the first person on Mount Sinai who's hiding in a cave. You remember about 400 years earlier, there was a man named Moses who was also on Mount Sinai and he prayed a courageous prayer and he said to God, show me your glory. Remember the story? Show me your glory and, and God says, I can't show you my glory. My glory is too much for you to behold. It would crush you, it would kill you. You would explode with joy if you would see all of who I am. But let's do this, I'm gonna give you a glimpse of my glory. Why don't you hide in that cave over here, God says to Moses. Hide in that cave and I'm going to pass by with my hand actually on the entrance of the cave. I'll just pass by and then once I've passed, I'll, like I pass by, like I'm going to declare who I am so you know what's happening outside. But then once I've passed the cave, uh, you can see the back of my head just for a glimpse second. And that's what happened to Moses. And some commentators, some Bible scholars, they believe that Elijah went to Mount Sinai because he was looking for a similar experience that Moses had. He was like, I'm going to go to that cave and see myself some of that God. Because I'm so discouraged, I need to know if he's really with me because I don't know what to believe right now. Makes sense, doesn't it? And so he goes there. And then the Lord said to him there, verse 9, and here's that question that I was asked in Mead, Kansas as well. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Are you lost? Why are you here? What are you running from? What are you 
hiding from? Elijah, what are you doing here? And I think, guys, this is so incredible. Don't miss the beauty of this, that God speaks to us even when we're in a cave. God speaks to us when we're in a cave. Guys, it's easy to experience God when you have a mountaintop experience with a big victory, like Mount Carmel. It's like, yeah, God did a big breakthrough. Like, it's easy to see. It's, it's encouraging to see God in that way. But let's not fool ourselves thinking this is the only way we can experience God. Some of you, you Christians, you, you, you do this. It was like, I've got to go to the next Christian conference. I've got to go to this worship night because on that mountaintop, that's the only place where I can experience God. You can experience God there, but it's not the only place where you can experience God. God also wants to meet you in your cave where you're locked in, where you are hiding, in the cave where the, there are walls all around you, and the shame and the blame and the defeat and the lies and all of that just bounces off the walls, and you're in that place, and you can't even see the way out. That's where God comes and wants to meet you. God speaks into depression. God speaks into dysfunction. God speaks into addiction. God speaks into defeat, and he says, I'm here. What are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah. What a God. And uh, Elijah, again, he repeats what he said earlier. It's like a broken record. Oh, it's pointless. Why am I doing this? I want to quit. And he even says to God, I'm the only one left. Nobody else but me. I'm the only one here. And God says, mm, I'm here, aren't I? You're not the only one left. I'm here, aren't I? And he's, God is saying to Elijah, what I'm trying to say to you right now is like, don't think that I'm only like the God who only meets you on the mountain. I'm here when you're trying to hide from it all. I'm here when you're hiding in a cave. Like, I think God wants to say this to you today. I'm there with you when you're trying to hide under the covers, when you just want to shut the world out. I'm there with you when you're opening a second box of ice cream, watching Netflix. It's like, oh, I can't do it. I'm like, this is the only thing that makes me feel something. God is there when you feel empty, when you feel worn out, when you feel hopeless. God's there like, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And then he says to him in verse 11, let me show you something. He says, go out and stand before me on that mountain. And it says, as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. Remember with Moses? Same thing, passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord, it says, was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. A whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said again, what are you doing here, Elijah? You see, if you're like me, I'm a bit confused why in that moment God whispered. Because Elijah was there and he wanted to see something dramatic, something spectacular. And it seems to me it would have been really spectacular and dramatic if God would have shown himself in the wind. <sighs> Here's God, but it says the Lord is not in the wind. It would have been amazing if God were in the earthquake, but it says the Lord was not in the earthquake. It would have been so cool if God were in the fire. Elijah loved fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. He whispered. And I'm confused. So why did God whisper? And then it came to me. God whispers because he is close. God whispers because he is close. Have you ever wondered why the shouts of the enemy always appear to be so loud? All of the accusations and the lies and the accuse is always so loud. But the voice of God is so still and so small. God whispers 
Because he's close. He's close. He doesn't need to shout at you. <laughs> he says, what are you doing here? How long are you going to hide in that cave? How long are you going to hold yourself captive in that cave? How long are you going to refuse to forgive that person that has hurt you? What are you doing here? God whispers because he is close, but you need to be still to hear him. I'm going to stop whispering now because it's getting a bit weird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> God whispers because that's how close he is. And you need to be still to hear him. God whispers through his word. God whispers through the promptings of the Holy Spirit where you just get an impulse. God whispers through other people around you, your small group, maybe a close friend, maybe a sermon, maybe a song, the words of somebody else, and they speak to you. It's like, wow, this is God gently whispering to me. And the more you listen, the more you recognize his voice. Maybe you want to write this down. The more you listen, the more you recognize his voice. Elijah, he came to that mountain. I believe he was looking for something dramatic, something spectacular, like Moses had experienced. But he, instead, he just got a gentle whisper. And I think that's because different hearts need different things from the richness of God's glory. Different hearts need different things. And uh, Elijah was in a place where he was so downcast and so done that what he needed was just something really, really personal, something really, really comforting, something assuring that would calm him down again. Let me explain it this way. Um, a while ago, I was at a hardware shop. I don't ever go to hardware shops. I don't know. Some of you, you live there. I don't understand you. To me, this is like purgatory. Like, why would you go there? It's like, I don't, I'm always, I'm not really good with DIY stuff. So that's like, I don't really go to hardware shops. But I was in this hardware shop. And I was confused, as everybody is in the hardware shop. I don't know what I need. Like, this is just too much and all that. And then there was this, in that same aisle where I was, there was a boy, maybe five, six years old, who also looked really uh, miserable. <laughs> and I looked at him and was like, yeah, I get it. I don't know what I need either. It's like, this is a terrible place to be. And I just didn't think of it. But then I heard him make this piercing noise that only five-year-old boys can make. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh. And then I realized, oh, yeah, he's lost. He, he lost his mom and dad or something, you know. And obviously, I, did, I didn't get it right away. But some other lady came to him and he says, are you lost? Have you lost your mommy or your daddy? And then <laughs> he started crying, he bawled his eyes out. And then a few moments later, there was this announcement on the speaker, like, would the parents of the boy who answers to the name of, would, he, would they please pick him up at information? And sure enough, then I guess the parents picked him up. A few moments, a few minutes later, I, I actually saw the boy again, and uh, he was with his dad. His dad was, on, like, he was sitting on his knee, like, and the, the dad was just holding him, you know, and whispering into his ear, and the boy was still crying, like, well, you lost me, like, you're stupid, you know, like, and the boy was still crying, but the dad was just holding him, whispering, whispering, I don't know what he said, but whispering into his ear, until, sure enough, the boy calmed down again. There's a verse in the book of Stephania, <laughs> where it says, the Lord quiets us with his love. The Lord quiets us with his love. He whispers to us to assure us. And have you noticed this, how amazing it is what you can keep calm through when you can hear the Father's voice? Some of you, you feel like you have a target on your back and the enemy's after you. But when you've learned to listen to the Father's voice, economies can collapse. Relationships can fall apart. You can lose your job. The doctors can tell you bad news, but you can still stand flat-footed in the middle of hell because you know, I can hear my father. Father's here. He's whispering. That means he's close. I'm not alone in this. And as we were singing earlier, if he's with me, who can be against me? Who can be against me? I don't have to be afraid anymore. And see, I think that's what changed for Elijah. He heard the whisper, 
And suddenly he was back on track. Suddenly he's like, okay, let's go. Let me close with this. Jane, you can come up. Um, but yeah, there is, uh, in verse 15, it says, the Lord told him, all right, get back into the game. Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. Would you turn to your neighbor and just say, get back into the game? Get back in the game. Come on, tell your neighbor that. Get back in the game. <laughs> Some of you, I, I, was, I wasn't sure if I should say this. Let me say this. Let me say this, and I, I hope it's not, it's not offending anybody. But some of you, because I've, I've spoken to many of you, some of you, you have been burned in church. Maybe this church, maybe a previous church. You've invested, and you've poured out, you've poured out, you've poured out, and you are just exhausted. You are tired, and you're done. And maybe even lost some of that hope. It's like, oh, I'm not sure. What's the point? I'm so glad you're here. I wonder if God wants to say to you today, get back in the game. There's more for us to do. They need you here at Mosaic. I'm glad you're here now. Get back in the game. Get involved. I have stuff for you to do. Don't just stay in that cave. I have stuff for you to do. So he says to Elijah, go back the way you came. And he's, he's talking to him about then in the verses in between about anointing different leaders that God has raised. And then he says, I will preserve 7,000 in Israel who have never bound down to Baal or kissed him. In other words, God is saying, Elijah, you may think you're alone in this, but you're not. I have thousands who are on our side. You just haven't seen them because you're just looking at your cave. There are thousands here. I've thought this thing through. Everything is going according to plan. Now get back into the game. I have stuff for you to do. I need to use you for this and for that and for that. My plans will be fulfilled. Okay? There's nothing that can stop my plans. You can bounce back, he says. You can walk by faith. My promises will be fulfilled. And Elijah, I think he's realizing in that moment, maybe you want to write this down, my victory is not based on how strong I am, but on how strong my God is. Write that down. My victory is not based on how strong I am, but on how strong my God is. That seems almost like a cliche sentence, but it has the power to change your life. Because I want to encourage you as we end the service to speak this over, to declare this over your life right now. Over your stress, over your addictions, over your defeats, over your conflicts in your relationships, over your unemployment, over your mental health struggles, over your physical health struggles. Speak this out. My victory is not based on how strong I am but on how strong my God is. Jesus is the name above every other name. His name is high and exalted. His name has power and authority. And His name is stronger. Stronger than darkness. Stronger than sickness. Stronger than bankruptcy. Stronger than unemployment. Stronger than that defeat that has hit you. I'm wondering... Um, If Elijah, if he were, it would have been singing any of our songs in church, if he would have been singing this, maybe he would have sung this one that we're singing now on his way back to Damascus. It goes like this. Hallelujah, our God reigns. You know this one? Hallelujah, our God reigns. And confidence starts to rise. Hallelujah, our God reigns forever all my days. Hallelujah. You know it. Okay, now I know you know it. I want you to stand and sing it over your life. Sing it, declare it. There's a God who reigns over this situation that you've lost control over. He still reigns. He still holds all things together. Okay, the team is coming up. Let's sing this one more time. Hallelujah, our God reigns. If you want to raise your hands to declare it. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Yes, He does. Hallelujah, our God reigns forever all my days. Hallelujah.